Yeah, I'm Robert Carley, and I'm going to talk about mental health, but you're going to talk with me, so I'm going to find out what kind of people are here. So I'm going to start with psychosymmetric testing. You okay with that? I want you to tell me, are you a red square, a green triangle, or a lovely yellow circle? Okay, hands up the red squares. Yeah, hands up the green triangles. And the lovely yellow circles. Excellent. Red squares, leaders, you are here at 2 o'clock. Get in, everyone, get in. You got your ticket, get in, get in. They haven't started, they're late, they're late, they're late. Green triangles, when there's a break, we'll all have coffee. I'll buy it, donuts. Group hug, everyone. <laughs> Yellow circles, obsessed with sex and drink. <laughs> <laughs> you can't wait for the after party. This is, this. You're only here for that. So listen, it's great to be here. I'm just going to share some thoughts. Um, ideas worth spreading. I have an idea worth spreading. It's love never fails. Love never fails. James Joyce, in the book Dubliners, in a great story called A Painful Case, talked about a man called Mr. Duffy, and he said Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And I think if you read the story, you'll see he was full of anxieties, full of worries, full of doubts. Maybe Mr. Duffy had what we call mental health issues. But mental health is so stigmatized, we won't even talk about it. They say that there's a one in four chance that you'll have a mental health issue. When I say that, people are going, one, two, three, four, they're screwed. <laughs> one, two, three, it's my seat, move. Here's the good news, it's four and four. We all have mental health. We all have an issue. We have to look after it, isn't that right? It's all our issues. But we make it posh. We say things like, I'm suffering with a bit of stress. I'm a little bit at odds. And maybe what made it stigmatized is the way we were educated in school. When I was in school, someone came to my school to teach me about dental health. They gave me three tips. They said, avoid sugar, brush regularly, and visit the dentist, and you'll have good teeth. I showed you three things they taught me on mental health in school. Nothing, nothing, and nothing. In fact, when I left, these are my notes on mental health maintenance. Blank. And I only learned it after I left school. After I left school, and I learned it through experience. I learned it through when I was 21. I went through serious panic attacks. I didn't even know what they were. When I was 35, I went through black depression for about nine months. I just couldn't lift my head. I didn't know what it was. And later on in life, I went through a serious sad patch. And I had no mental health tips to help me through it. And fortunately, on my journey, I met people who shared the one idea, the one thing to help me. Here's the three best that I've learned. The first one is kind of this, I think. Thing called the health continuum. There's days when we're well, and days when it's crap. Days when everything goes right, and days when everything's going wrong. Our problem is we want to go from the bad days to the great days in one jump. It's one step at a time. It's a small thing. That's why I took part in the government campaign, the little things. It's the cup of tea. It's meeting the friend. It's having a chat. It's reading good books. It's going good places. It's the odd kiss, the odd hug, with someone who wants you to kiss and hug them, obviously, because <laughs> you've got to help their mental health as well. <laughs> That's what it is. It's simple. Raindrops and roses, whiskers and kittens. These are a few of my favorite. When do I do them? When the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad. I simply remember my favorite things and then... <laughs> mental health maintenance. Second thing, if I've learned to control my thoughts, take captive my thoughts, because I've learned that my thoughts become my mood, my mood becomes my word and my actions, and that becomes my results. Starts my thoughts. It starts with a thought. You know you have 65,000 thoughts a day. If you're Irish, most of them are negative. <laughs> How are you feeling? Grand. <laughs> I hear you got married. I did. <laughs> How's it going? Grand. Or Irish people, if you say, my leg fell off, what do they say? I'll give you a better one. <laughs> I don't want a better one. My one's good. My sad story. So we fight against our thoughts all the time. What if we started replacing a negative thought with a positive thought? Would it have an effect? Here's the thing. Watch the way your head works. Close your eyes and think of the happiest day of your life. You got it? Enjoy it. Remember it. Feel it. It's just a thought, but it made you feel good, didn't it? So if we can learn to take captive our thoughts, that's a great thing. And the next thing I learned, which is a fantastic tip for mental health maintenance, is that love never fails. I'll show you where I got that. 
A man called Paul wrote a letter to a church in a place called Corinthians, and everyone reads it at their wedding. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not puffed up. I love you, you love me, we love each other, we'll never split up. <laughs> and we, can you imagine a priest doing it that way? <laughs> <laughs> and the reading now is, love is patient, love is kind, love is not. <laughs> okay, love never fails, ever. 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 Here's a love story. For a short while, Rob Carley lived a short distance from his own body too. When I was young, I was uh, part of a motorbike gang. We were, um, <laughs> <laughs> we were sons of apathy. That's who we were. <laughs> And uh, I lived with a fantastic mom and dad. They were really good, great parents. They spoiled me rotten. They looked after me. Um, for a job, I was the sheriff of Griffith Barracks <laughs> and uh, was on the beach. And when I was young, there was a thing called gravel. I don't know, you all look very young. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a thing called gravel. And when you ran, you fell, you skidded, you ripped. <laughs> and you went home to your mother with that cry. You know that cry where nothing comes out? <laughs> Come on, son. And eventually, Wah! and then your mother would go, come to me, come to me, come to me. She'd wash it, and she'd put iodine on it. Mother of God. Wah! You got loads of love off your mom, and I was clever. I could get it off my dad too, but I had to keep the cry going until five o'clock. <laughs> and clearly you can't cry for four hours, so you have to do this thing called the sob. Did you ever use a sob? <laughs> You can even talk having a sob. I'm just going down to the sh sh oops. So when my dad would come home, go, and he'd say, what happened to you? My dad was a big, fat soldier. And he'd open his army jacket, the brass buttons down the front of the jacket. And he'd put one of my little seven-year-old arms in that side, and one in that side. And he'd button up the jacket. And the smell of turf cigarette smoke and sweat and my dad's aftershave and it was just heaven and he'd go don't be crying son you're lovely you're lovable and you're loved man there's a space love never fails ever ever so then dad got transferred to Cork would you believe we lived in Dublin and I don't know if there's anyone from Cork here but if you're from Dublin and you move to Cork we speak different languages right so Come here, where are you from, boy? Come over here. What? I say in Dublin, we're taught to walk by pigeons. <laughs> what? Come here. So, we were there for five years, and it happened to be the time when I became a teenager, and I got, you know, teenager things, you get anxiety, you get spots, you get long hair, you get greasy, you get hairs popping out of places you didn't even know you had places, you know. What's that? You get all sorts of weird feelings, all sorts of strange feelings, which I still get, and all sorts of those things. You go through this thing called puberty, and it's horrible. Suddenly got really anxious. Now add to that, my mother, who is a bargain hunter. Hands up if you have a mother that's a bargain hunter. You know those things when everyone else is wearing wranglers, your mother goes to town and goes, I got you a pair of wanglers. <laughs> they were only three pounds. I'm going, you going to get killed. And I got your radidas runners and a roller jumper. Mom! And then to cover it all up, thanks be to God, she bought you the anorak that you would grow into. Did you ever have one of them? <laughs> so for four years you're in school like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> then dad gets transferred back to Dublin. I now have a Cork accent. They decide to send us to a North Dublin comprehensive school. You do not want a Cork accent in a North Dublin comprehensive school. I end up in a class where my classmates' names were Dogger, Dunner, Fang, Sculler, and a bloke called Nailer. And we didn't even do woodwork. He just had a hammer in his bag. <laughs> so there's me, pretending I can't speak, because they surely can't know I have a Cork accent, right? So I'm, <laughs> hey, you, where are you from? Nowhere particularly. <laughs> so I'm doing okay, I'm keeping the head down, I'm full of anxiety. To make it worse, I was wearing the big anorak, the wanglers, right, and I'm sitting on the step, eating soup for my lunch every day, which my loving mother gave me in a big flask, you know the tartan ones? Short of putting a target on my head <laughs> and writing, please kick my son to death. This was my mother's gift of love. 
one day I'm drinking my soup and a bloke comes up to me and goes, here, you. Gene Manahan fancies you. Now, Jean Manahan was the best looking girl in our school. Oh, my Lord God. She was amazing. And everyone wanted to go out with Jean Manahan, except me. Because I thought, if I say, does she really fancy me? They'll go, no, she doesn't, you fool. Why would she fancy you? So on the spot, I made up a girlfriend. I said, I can't. I'm going out with a girl called Suzanne. Where does she live? Till this day, I don't know. I went, Bristol. (laughs) So for the next two years, I had to make up stories about things me and Suzanne did in Bristol. Now, for the young people, this was pre-internet, right? So I had to go to the library, research Bristol, (laughs) and all I could find was they have two football teams and a cathedral. So our dates consisted, we went to the match, and then we went to mass. That was like... (laughs) But the real problem was, I'd never had a girlfriend. So every week they go, hey, Jean Manhattan fancies you, wants to know, will you go out with her? And I'm going, I can't, because I didn't know how to kiss. And then all my anxieties came in. I'm like, oh God, how am I going to make this work? So then I did what we all do. I practiced on my arm. Don't judge me, you did it too, right? So that, went, that relationship went well for about a year. And then I, I graduated to the bathroom mirror. Oh, big days. Till I heard my dad go, Flurry, come in here. I think we have snails in the bathroom. <laughs> like, so I had to break it off with the mirror for a short time. We can't keep seeing each other. So, <laughs> so, on the 25th of September, 1978, at half four in the prefect's room in Mount Temple Comprehensive School on the Malahide Road, I kissed Jean Manahan. <laughs> For an hour and a half. <laughs> because love never fails and we fell in love and we went through the whole teenage love thing and we had a fantastic relation when we were 23 um, I asked her to marry me and she did oh, I wasn't that bad <laughs> she's making out like a pity thing I'm all, so, so. so she married me and then we had an incredible family uh, five kids Jonathan, Joanna, Deborah, James and Timothy or if you want them in quick Johnny, Joey, Debbie, Jimmy, Timmy come in and uh, we, we had an amazing an amazing relationship we had an amazing relationship And then I went through depression, and every day Jean would say to me, come on, Rob, tomorrow could be better. And she encouraged me. She said, come on, let's do something that makes you feel better. And she encouraged me, and she said, let's change the way you're thinking. And she encouraged me, because when you're down and you've no hope, sometimes you need someone to show you hope. But love never fails. And then we went through relationship problems. We ended up in counseling. We ended up at separation talks. I don't know how it happened. We stopped talking. And on the day we were to separate, I got a fit of giggles. And it ended up with me asking her out for coffee. And her going, is that a date? And me saying it might be. And you know what? We put it back together again. Because love never fails. And we travelled around Ireland telling people that this is our story. This is what can happen. Don't ever give up. There's always hope. Love never fails. And we took that story to Africa, to Uganda. And I remember being in Africa with, with Jean in Uganda. And she stopped with this little kid who had his two legs amputated. And she said, Rob, we've got to do something. We can't leave these people without some help. I'm like, well, what could we do? And she went, we could build a hospital. And I went, we couldn't do that. She said, we could. I said, it'll cost a fortune and take forever. And she said, we have forever. And we'd raise the money. So, love never fails, no matter where you are. And we came home from Uganda. And that was in August. And the next week in September, 4.15 p.m., I got a phone call to say, Rob, can you get to James's hospital? Gene isn't well. And the next phone call said, Rob, what's Gene's blood group? The next phone call said, can you bring your children with you? Gene's really sick. And when we got to James's hospital, the lovely Jean was on a life support machine. And, uh, and we lost her. And she passed away. So the girl I met when I was 13 and I lost when I was 49. What do you do? What do you do? But you know what keeps you going? Love never fails. Love depend, doesn't depend on people. doesn't depend on presence. It depends on passion. 
It never fails, ever, ever. So I started living the life of those things that I've learned on mental health campaigns and mental health workshops, and I learned that I can make a difference to my own life. I'm convinced that I'm made on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. There's a jigsaw in life that only I fit, and if I don't turn up, no one else can fill that space. Does that make sense? There's a space for you. You're in the jigsaw too. And if we don't turn up and do our bit, who else will? Our love can't fail. So people came into my life to do things, to encourage me. My kids were fantastic. They didn't let me go. And people held me and hugged me and told me that I was lovely, lovable, and loved. Because love never fails. And one day I'm in church. This girl was sharing her grief with me. And then we were talking. She said, why don't we start something for senior citizens? Don't know why she told me this. Okay, so she wanted to start a club called Just Older Youth. So we had meetings, and then we had another meeting, and another meeting, and about 10 meetings later, then I start going, I'm wearing aftershave to these meetings. And then I start, I'm dressing up for these meetings. And then I realized, I'm actually falling for the second person in my life. So I said to her, real churchy, I said, listen, we better bring someone else to these meetings. And I, she said, why? I said, because my motives aren't pure. She said, don't bring any, because mine definitely aren't. So, <laughs> so, so we fell in love. And I'm not one for hanging around, so on our third date, I asked her, if I asked you to marry me, would you? And she went, I might. <laughs> no, I took that as a yes. Okay, so, <laughs> so I worked on it. And we did get married, and we did have a fantastic day, and she is an incredible woman in my life who has made a huge difference to my life. And you know what she teaches me? She teaches me that love never fails. Love never, ever fails. And together she helped me and all the children, we all raised money, and we went to Uganda, and we found a site and we raised enough funds to put down the foundations. Then we raised enough fun funds to put up the walls and put on the roof. And last week I was in Uganda and I signed off a snag list for the Jean Carley Memorial Hospital in Kumi in Uganda. It's a 28 bed <laughs> children's hospital. And I'll tell you why I'm happy to do that. Because for me, it says in more ways than I could ever say, Love never fails, ever, ever fails. You are all lovely, lovable, and loved. It doesn't matter if I tell you, you gotta come to the space where I came, where you realize that I am lovely, lovable, and loved. I'm gonna ask you to do one thing for me. Will you do that for me? Turn to the person beside you and just say, love never fails. And turn to the person on the other side and tell them as well. <laughs> and are you ready? And we will all say it together. Love never fails. Thank you.